Well, good evening, everyone. Welcome. My name is Lucinda Martin, and I'm the director of the Ritman Research Institute and the Bibliotheca Philosophica Hermetica, the Library of Hermetic Philosophy. I'd like to welcome you to the lecture of Emil Schreiber on the book culture of the first generations of Portuguese Jewish refugees in Amsterdam. Emil's lecture is the keynote for a conference that will take place here over the next two days on the topic of Amsterdam as a haven for religious refugees in the early modern period. In the 16th and 17th centuries, thousands of Portuguese Jews, French Huguenots, German spiritualists, and others fled persecution and came to Amsterdam, where there was much more freedom of speech and religion. These religious refugees faced the same problems that refugees face today in trying to rebuild their lives in a foreign country. Fortunately, some came to their aid. In the 17th century, the former owners of this house, the de Kea family, gave financial support to a number of religious refugees. Two that they helped were Christian Hoburg and Friedrich Breckling. Both had been exiled from Germany for writing against the Lutheran Church's involvement in war. Another dissident that the family supported was Ludwig Friedrich Giftheil, a wandering prophet who called for holy war, which he believed would end all wars. How are we to understand this support, on the one hand, for the pacifists Breckling and Hoburg, and on the other hand, for the warmonger Giftile? Maybe the de Geo family simply wanted to support their right to express their opinions freely. The most well-known recipient of the de Geo's support was Jan Amos Comenius. He's known today as a great philosopher and reformer of education, and lived for a short time here at the House with the Heads, and the de Geer family paid to publish his writings. The case of Comenius adds an important dimension to our discussions of refugees in early modern Amsterdam. In the conference papers tomorrow and the next day, we'll hear about the challenges the refugees faced, but also about their contributions to Amsterdam and indeed to the world. Comenius teamed up with other refugees to develop a school to put his educational theories into practice, and he collaborated with others on a series of projects. This is just one example of how these refugees from different countries and different confessions who lived within walking distance of one another developed into a new kind of community, an intellectual and religious melting pot. The refugees who came to Amsterdam enriched the city, and through the dozens of printing presses that sprang up to print their writings, they've enriched our world. The achievements of these refugee authors and hundreds of other dissident voices are documented in the Bibliotheca Philosophica Hermetica, the library that forms the core collection of the Embassy of the Free Mind Museum. In their writings, the authors in our library paved the way for what are now called human rights. For this reason, last Friday, our library was added to the UNESCO Memory of the World Register. Over the next two days, we'll hear papers from both established academics with deep knowledge and young scholars who are just starting their careers and who are bringing fresh perspectives. The participation of these young researchers was made possible by a generous grant by Mr. Scott Brown, and we thank Scott for his generosity. I invite everyone to follow some of these lectures, either here in person or by Zoom. And I want to now introduce our first lecturer, Professor Emil Skriver, the general director of the Jewish Cultural Quarter, which I'm given to understand is actually five museums. And he's a professor of Jewish, uh, Jewish heritage at the University of Amsterdam. He's also the curator of the Braginsky Collection of Hebrew Manuscripts and Books in Zurich and the editor of the Encyclopedia of Jewish Book Cultures from Brill. And he serves on many international committees. And if that's not enough, last year he published a literary thriller entitled The Halil Codex. So please join me in welcoming Emil Skriver.
Yeah, thank you very much, those present. I'm also looking at the camera every once in a while because there will be people in back behind the camera. Uh, thank you very much for this invitation. It's not the first time I stand here in, on this, actually in this very spot. I'm very happy just to be able to work with all of you, with Jo Ritman, with all the others here uh, working for the uh, well, this, for this big institute and for this important institute. We worked together on a Kabbalah exhibit a few years ago, which we did in cooperation with the uh, Jewish Museum in Vienna and in cooperation with some of the people present here. And it's a, pr a project that we really took pride in, uh, also in the cooperation. So that is, uh, for me, it's a, an honor to be, uh, to be standing here. And <clears throat> talking about the topic of your, of your conference and the, the concept of refugees, the, let's dive into the deep and come up with perhaps the most difficult aspect of the title of my lecture is which to which, to which extent can we still consider the Portuguese Jews in Amsterdam to be refugees? The Portuguese Jews in Amsterdam were the, uh, are the family members of those who were expelled from Spain in 1492, from, from Portugal 1495-96 and were either allowed to stay if they would become Catholics or saw themselves forced to move for, from Spain to Portugal in many cases or let's say around the Mediterranean basin and, and find a way to define, to continue to define uh, their own Jewish identity. And it's a very difficult situation. These were refugees. These were people running away from a hostile uh, environment trying to find a new safety. There were also people who stayed and had a, let's say, more of a secret continuation of their Jewish identity, not visible to the outside world. Uh, but there were also many who moved away from the Iberian Peninsula towards Italy, towards North, North Africa, towards southern France. And in, within this, in the, in the course of the 16th century, all kinds of mixed identities of Jews developed. But many people also moved away from traditional Judaism. Many Jews had become Catholics and the, the, they had decided to go all the way and to, 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 and to become, not, not, it's not a majority, but so we have all kinds of mixed identities during that 16th century. And in Amsterdam, these Jews arrived more than a century, the first of this group of Jews arrived more than a century after the actual expulsion from Spain and later on Portugal. The first written documentation that we have is really from the second half of the last decade of the 16th century. So the, there's more than 100 years between the actual expulsion of these people, but it, it does not mean that they were not a people on the move. And the fact that they were on the move actually defines them most probably still as refugees. And we will see also later on during my talk to which extent, to what extent the they also felt uh, connected to their homeland, which is again a very clear, uh, a very clear sign of them still consider considering themselves people who were living somewhere where they didn't come from originally. So that's so I, I think we can live with the idea of refugee, but the actual act of fleeing, the actual act of moving from one country to another happened a century earlier. So that is the first, and this is of course true of many other groups. I mean, people end up in a particular uh, locale one way or the other, and that can take a century apparently. So this is very much true of the, of the Portuguese Jewish community. And the, so let's, let's continue to call them refugees, although many would not have perhaps not defined themselves as refugees per se. So this is something that I find very uh, important to tell to you. We're talking about the books. And what I want to take you through, you have, tomorrow you will have a book tour. And we were looking at a couple of books by Manasseh ben Israel before, which, which are actually connected to your book tour. Because the life of one particular figure in Jewish Amsterdam of the 17th century is connected to the beginning of Jewish printing in Amsterdam. The first Jew to print Hebrew in Amsterdam, not the first to print Hebrew in Amsterdam, the first Jew to print Hebrew in Amsterdam, was this man by the name of Manasseh ben Israel. 
And we have books upstairs, books printed by him, books edited by him, books that he found very important. And he was a very interesting figure, and he will be one of the leading figures in my talk for tonight, because he, by understanding the life of Manasseh, you also can start to understand the complexity of, in, of intellectual life in Amsterdam of that first half of the 17th century. <clears throat> there is almost a generation between the first arrival of, or there is a full generation, between the moment of the first arrival of Portuguese Jews in Amsterdam at the end of the 16th century and the start of Manasseh ben Israel as an active printer of Hebrew uh, in that same city. He was born in 1604, but his life is typical. He was born at, in Lisbon into a family of so-called Muranos. I don't like the word, but it's of, the, it's of, of people who were uh, living this secret life of Jews, of being Jews on the inside, but being less visible on the outside. And according to a custom, to, to a custom he got his godfather's name and was baptized Ma Manuel Diaz Suero. So he, is a, he had this double identity, this mixed identity, a Jewish family, um, but also to the outside. And, and this is an important aspect of Portuguese Jews in general. They never have one name. They might have three different names by which they moved around. The Jewish name by which they were known within the Jewish community. The Spanish name by which, in this particular case, he would have been baptized. And here in the Netherlands, they had yet another name which they used in their context with the outside world. So the, the aspect of identity is, is at the core of the presence of Portuguese Jews in the Netherlands. And I think it's very important to keep that in mind. These people were constantly aware of this complexity of their own identity. And that also, in the course of the years, forced them to redefine, to constantly reconsider, and later on to redefine what they called, what they could call their own Jewish identity. Um, in Spain, his father was persecuted by the Inquisition, which is, of course, also very much part of the Jewish experience in Spain and Portugal. And then they went into exile as refugees refugee family, first to La Rochelle in France, which was a very important community where there was a very important presence of Jews uh, in, in, in the 16th, 16th and 17th centuries, and then on to Amsterdam. La Rochelle is, of course, also as a port, as a port city, very important. It's a city on the coast. It's very important because the, there was a lot of religious, consider, there were a lot of re religious considerations for these Jews who were moving from Spain or from southern France up, to, up north, but some of, the religious, some of their considerations were not religious. There were also economic considerations. And one of the reasons why these Jews would want to move upward was, yes, the potential of a certain level of freedom of religion. Not entirely. I mean, Jews had to negotiate, and we have a lot of uh, contemporary research going on on the actual negotiations of Jews uh, under which circumstances they were allowed to enter the country or to enter a particular city or not. The city of Alkmaar, the city of Haarlem, have charters in which, in which is defined under which circumstances and under which conditions Jews are allowed in. The city of Amsterdam had, such a, had a similar report being made, and if you look at the action, which was actually never implemented, uh, and if you look at the content of that, the, you will see that a lot of the considerations are religious, but the, 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 it's, there, there is a, I wouldn't say it's anti-Semitic, but it's not, it's everything but positive towards the Jews. And part of the consideration process was always the economic potential that the Jews would offer to the Dutch through their international networks. So the presence of Jews in the important port cities in Europe Later on in Amsterdam, La Rochelle, Porto, and the New World, the potential of that triangle was big enough for the Dutch to give up on, uh, to give up on any objections that they might have to Jewish presence in that 17th century. And for the Jews, it was an incentive to move upwards. For the Jews, it was an incentive to move northwards. So the so this, I think it's very important that we keep this aspect in mind. It's not only about the freedom of religion that people, many people will tell you they found in Amsterdam, 
Yes, there was a lot of freedom of religion, but the considerations in back of it were political slash economic. And this is, of course, oftentimes true of, let's say, 17th century, Netherlands in the 17th century. The family took an active part in Jewish life, so they found the opportunity in La Rochelle, but later on, especially in Amsterdam. Um, and father and son both joined a study circle, Santa Imandada, the Talmud Torah, uh, which had just been founded. So they were at the heart of the beginning intellectual life of this new community. And that first generation of Jews uh, saw the, 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 the beginning of, uh, of the, the definition of their own intellectual center. The library Es Chaim, the oldest, and Haida Wanke, who's the curator, is here and will be in your conference tomorrow as well. The library Es Chaim is the oldest still functioning Jewish library in the world, still present as a beautiful gem in the city of Amsterdam, in the, in, in the, in the, uh, in the buildings surrounding the Portuguese synagogue. The library Es Chaim is from that very same year. So the, this is where the intellectual life of this community started, and this is also a period in which the self-definition of this new group of immigrants who came from everywhere, and who had family members in La Rochelle, who had family members in the Southern Netherlands, who had family members in Spain, who had Catholic family members in Spain, who had family members in the New World later on in the 17th century. It's all about networking. And the networks were strong for the fact that they were a diaspora people, but the networks were also strong because they were oftentimes family-defined networks. So the presence of a family network is typically Many people will tell you not to do business with your family, but it would, it would typically be, uh, will typically be more reliable uh, than just another uh, commercial uh, connection that you would have. So this family aspect is very important. He writes his first book at the age of 17, uh, Hebrew grammar, Safa Bura, of which two copies are known, one in Eschayim and one in the Biblioteca Hosea Tayana in, uh, in Amsterdam, written in Hebrew. So Hebrew grammar, of the Hebrew language. Um, starting with the grammar, I mean, this is also why would you, so, so it, it, it proves the centrality, the central position that the holy language took in, in, the, in the mind of this young scholar, of this young aspiring scholar. And the, so it's very important to keep that in mind. If you look at the way that the, and Heide can tell you a lot more about that, but if you look at the way in which uh, these, this group of people defined their tuition system, for example, it is clear that it was much more based in biblical study than, it, than your typical rabbinical Judaism was. Rabbinical Judaism is about Talmud study, it's about studying halakha, studying Jewish law, and the Bible is there as the foundation on which this rabbinic literature stands. But for the Portuguese Jews of Amsterdam, the Bible was at the core of their learning, and the fact that he would have written the Hebrew grammar, which is in a way a sort of an opening up the holy language of the Hebrew Bible, of the Old Testament, as you would call it in other religions, that, that is extremely that's an important token, an important sign of the way, of, of the importance attached to Bible study and, and of, their, of the way in which this group of young intellectuals in Amsterdam defined their particular form of Judaism. So this, I think this is a very important point. He, he became involved in primary education and he becomes the rabbi of a small local synagogue. In 23 he marries Rachel Ababanel, who is a strong connection with one of the most prominent pre-expulsion Spanish Jewish families. Abravanel, as we would now call it, uh, Abravanel is an important family, and, and, and Yitzhak Abravanel, Isaac uh, Abravanel, was one of the most important Jews in pre-expulsion Spain, who was actually active at the courts of the very king and queen that, expe that expelled the Jews, uh, but he was given a big sum of money uh, to, continue, to be able to continue his life, but he was still not given the opportunity to remain a Jew, so he left the country. Um, Manasseh marries into that family. So again, the people were strongly connected and they were pretty much aware, very aware, of the connection that they had to their Iberian homeland. He got three children and he then becomes a teacher of Talmud studies. But he starts with the Bible. 
And that is essential. I mean, that is important to our understanding of the minds of these people. And it's very much different from our traditional Eastern European Jewish approach to Jewish knowledge, which is really fact-based in, in the Talmud, in the Talmudic literature, in rabbinic literature, rather than in Bible lit biblical literature. And many scholars will argue that this is actually something that is taken over from Jesuit teaching. The teaching of the Jesuits, which is also very much based in the study of the Old Testament, in the study of text and of the biblical text. Which is, ex in, as such, explainable, can be explained easily when you take into consideration the, the difficult, the, let's say, all these mixed identities, which blend, in a way, the, the core Jewish identity that these people had, and all the external influences, particularly the Catholic influence that, they, that, that was put on them. So this is something that is really becoming very important in the thinking um, of these people. The 1st of January, 1627, he publishes the first Hebrew book. I go in, so, into a bit more detail afterwards. And he founded this publishing house. So there was Hebrew printing already. I will show you that afterwards as well. There was some Hebrew printing, not a lot, but there were experiments among Christians with Hebrew printing. But, the, uh, but it's important that he was the first Jew to print Hebrew in Amsterdam. He writes in many languages. He published in many languages. We don't know exactly in which languages he wrote, I think, but we, he, he, he published in many languages. He wrote Conciliador, an attempt to reconcile, again, discordant passages in the Old Testament. And that was something that put him in touch with the non-Jewish world, which was, of course, not Catholic. It was the Protestants who were in touch with So he was very much between all these religions in, in that very... Amsterdam, 17th century landscape. He was one of the most visible Jews. He was one of the most. He was not necessarily only liked by his fellow Jews for that, but he was in constant touch with the Christian world, and he was also an important spokesman for the Jewish world and an important informant for the Christian world in things Jewish. So that is something to keep in mind. Baleus wrote a Latin poem in praise of Manasseh. So uh, that's not a, it's not a small thing. It goes to show the level of, of kindness and friendship uh, between these two men, although you never know exactly the actual nature of, let's say, the definition of the friendship, because he was still a Jew. And this is something that, that has, will always have defined the relationships that he, Manasseh and all the other Jews of the 17th century who were in touch with the, with the Christian world would have had. Rembrandt makes an etching which many people believe represents Manasseh. It doesn't, we think, uh, by now, although other people will contest and say it might still have been Manasseh. And the image that I showed, that I started with, is actually a contemporary engraving, which doesn't look very much like the Rembrandt portrait. Um, but this is probably what it looks like, an engraving by someone earlier. Um, the is a, a rabbi one of the rabbis in the newly founded community, Talmud Torah, founded in 1639. And this is the Portuguese Jewish community as we still have it. So the first generation of Portuguese Jews uh, had three different uh, congregations. And the three different congregations united in 1639 to become Talmud Torah, and that is still the name of the present congregation. So the, this also is an, is an interesting aspect. So you can see that there was an, an active attempt made to, to make one community out of this, these various groups of Portuguese Jews that were in the same city, had their own congregation, and they wanted to have this one Amsterdam Portuguese Jewish, Amsterdam Sephardic, Sephardic is the Hebrew word for Spain, so the Amsterdam for the Iberian Peninsula, an Amsterdam Sephardic identity. It is very important to them. They wanted to, be, to present themselves, to be seen, and also probably conceived of themselves as one group, as one entity slash identity. He, he was not an easy man. He was in constant trouble. I mean, there, was all, there were always issues with this, with this community. He was excommunicated for a day. I mean, we know of other examples of people who were excommunicated longer. Uh, we have Spinoza upstairs, and uh, Spinoza didn't want to return. 
Jewish excommunication, the, 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 the idea of cherem, of a ban, um, actually has in it the uh, option for any person banned to repent within a period of 30 days. The public repentance within 30 days. And when you pu repent publicly, then you're basically you're allowed to be, be part of the community again. One of the interesting things with, with Spinoza, he wasn't interested in that. So Spinoza never repented because he didn't want to be a member of the community anymore. So he was excommunicated. It was an interesting conference here in 2015, October 2015, uh, December 2015, there was a conference in which this was being discussed. Should the Portuguese community of Amsterdam not re-allow, reinstate uh, Spinoza as a member of the community? And there were a number of arguments against that. There, were, there was a group of people uh, Con and pro, and, and, and every time you listen to one of these specialists, uh, you believe them. <laughs> so the ones that were against it and the ones that were in favor, you could believe all of them, because they all had solid argument. Then the rabbi came, the chacham of the community, Toledano, and he said there, we can't do it. We can't do it because he clearly didn't want it. As I was already saying, he would have wanted it. We can't do it because the only the court of law, the rabbinic court of law that issued the ban can reject the, the, the ban, so that is, uh, it, we don't have that court of law anymore, so we cannot uh, change it around. And he said, which is a very interesting argument, you cannot expect a religious community to re-accept a person who discusses the existence of God, and for whom the existence of God is a topic. And actually, there's not a lot to say uh, against that. That was accepted. It was a very interesting, uh, was a very interesting meeting. But for Manasseh, who was out of the uh, community for one day, and it's important to keep that in mind. The ban, and if you read the text of the Cherem, is very harsh. I mean, it's 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 really it's really extremely harsh. But it's also an old text. It's a 15th century text. It was not written only for Spinoza. There were adaptations made. But the concept, as such, is that you're being banned. And if you want to return or you repent, you return. So, the, so this, is, this is important to keep in mind. Um, he considered to go to Brazil. Many people don't know that the Dutch presence in Brazil in the 1630s up to the 1650s, the large the majority of these people were Dutch Jews, actually, who went there. So there was a very strong Jewish presence in the group of Dutch who went to Brazil, the Recife area, in Pernambuco, in the Pernambuco region. So the, the Manasseh wanted to go there, but he was apparently not allowed to go there. And his big competitor as a rabbi, Isaac Abouabta Fonseca, the, one of the, the, the chief rabbi of the community at the time, he went there. And they'd worked together. He was his corrector, he worked his, Isaac Abouabta Fonseca was his first corrector, but there was a constant competition going on between the two men. And Manasseh was, in trouble. He's appointed head of the Talmud Academy, delivers a speech during the visit of Prince of Orange. I mean, he was a big man, I mean, he, but he was also, he was a visible person, um, and he passes the printing house into the hands of Elia Boab because of financial problems. So he was not only in religious problems, he was not only in personal problems, he also had financial problems, and the, uh, but he stayed on as a corrector. So you see this constant role changing to which I will uh, come to the end of this lecture. He, he, we, we tend to think of book production and we tend to think of intellectual life uh, with our contemporary glasses, with our glasses of today, in which different roles, be that the role of a corrector, the role of a printer, the role of a typesetter, the role of a publisher, the role of a scholar, the role of the reader, in which the, all these different roles have been taken on by, oftentimes, by different people. Manasseh did everything. So that is important to keep in mind. That's why I like to speak about book culture, not about book printing. It's a cultural thing. It's the, it's, it's the centrality of the book in the thinking of a people. The, he passes his on in 46 to, the, to his sons, Joseph, and in 48 to his second son after the death of his first son, uh, and in, in 1652, he takes charge again. And then in 55, he does what he became famous for in Britain, because he was the first Jew and the only Jew to apply for the resettlement 
readmission of the Jews to England after they had been expelled from England in 1290. So in 1290 they were expelled from England, 1190, was it? 1290. And um, even the 1190 is York and 1290 is expulsion, I think. And so the, he went to Oliver Cromwell and made a plea in White House, uh, in Whitehall. He made a, a, a plea in Whitehall to, for the readmission of the Jews to England. And, he had a, and we have printed proof of that. We have the text that he, that he, that he spoke there. And he, he became, this is why he was called in his first biography that was published about him, Rabbi, Printer, Diplomat. He was a Jewish diplomat as such. He went there. But many people thought, uh, let's say he was, I mean, it was brave. But it was also quite, quite, how would I say, it, perhaps an overstatement of confidence uh, that he would be able to pull that off. And interestingly, he left London disappointed. He didn't see any direct results of his effort. And he dies on the 25th, the 20th of November, 1657, at Middleburg, upon his return, and where he buried the mortal remains of his son Samuel, who died in England. So yet another son who died. So he was an, a very unhappy man towards the end of his life. But actually, he didn't live to see the success of his plea for the readmission, because Oliver Cromwell, like in Amsterdam, where there was not, never a formal decision to allow the Jews to settle, also in England, there was never a formal, formal decision for the readmission, but they were readmitted. So he was successful. And the considerations behind that were probably the same as the considerations in Amsterdam, which is not about, not necessarily about religious freedom, but rather about economic opportunity. So it's, this is something that is very important to keep in mind. But there was Hebrew printed in Amsterdam in the year 1605 and 1606 by Hugh Brot, an English scholar. Uh, and this is a book called Pashek and Nishtavan. Both are Persian words in Hebrew, actually, that mean letter. And they're, they're a letter from a Jew from Constantinople, but printed in Hebrew. It's a text with the Christian content. It was produced for a Christian, uh, for a Christian audience. But it uses Hebrew type. It's not woodcuts. I mean, it re uses Hebrew type. It has its only own designed Hebrew type. It's clearly, I would say, uh, clearly, it's perhaps a bit, it's, it's, it's clear that this was produced in a Christian setting. It's very difficult to define that in a scholarly setting. But oftentimes, you can see from the script, regardless of the quality, and this is true in the Christian world as well, re regardless of the quality of the calligrapher, of the scribe, you can oftentimes see from the script whether someone is actually the member of the community that uses the script. So the Hebrew script written by Christians, I can oftentimes see that it's a very, uh, it can still be a very good hand, and it can still be a very accomplished hand. But oftentimes I can see that it doesn't absorb the tradition of the script that is part of Jewish tradition. And this is true of many of the scripts that you find in books like this, and this is very much true of this book by you brought them, but uh, this was a group of books for a small group of Protestant scholars who were interested in this. So the, but it's the first attempt to print Hebrew uh, in Amsterdam. Of course, it's, pre it's preceded by all the printing that went on in the city of Leiden. The, all, the, all the Oriental printing, but there in Leiden, it was part of an Oriental printing tradition. And the, all the oriental printing under Franciscus of Raphaelentrius in Leiden, uh, which was basically a, a satellite company of Plantins, Christopher Plantins uh, printing press from Antwerp, and it was moved, all the, all the oriental printing was moved to Leiden in the course of the 1570s. Um, the, that actually absorbed a lot of Jewish elements, although it was Christian printing. Because the type that was used by Raphael Engier in Amsterdam, in, in Leiden, was the type that was used by Christopher Plantin in, uh, in Antwerp, which was the type that was used by Daniel van Bombergen, Daniel Bomberg, a non-Jewish printer who was active, an Antwerp printer, who was active in Venice and who was responsible for all the important imprints of Jewish literature. A cooperation between, he was active between 1516 and 1549. He died in 1551 in Antwerp. He was active in Venice, worked together with all the rabbis of Venice to produce the canon of Jewish literature.
a Christian. He saw the market, the Jews cooperated with him because they saw the market, but he incorporated all the Jewish knowledge about book production, about the quality of type, and he moved his type material when he, toward the end of his life, when he left Venice in 1549, he took all his type material to Antwerp, and the planting press, while printing Hebrew, claimed oftentimes that they uh, printed Beotiot Bomberge, with the letters of Bomberg. So this is a concept that, that, so there is a tradition of Jewish printing, but there will always be some sort of Christian involvement, uh, Jewish printing, but there will always be some sort of Christian involvement, which is, I think, more than anything else, a sign of the minority position that Jewish printers have always taken in their diaspora existence. They were always a minority, and it's impossible as a small group to produce high quality Hebrew books without taking into, into consideration, being in touch with, communicating, connecting with the outside world. And the outside world was non-Jewish. So this is, this, this was all, all of this was already going on in Amsterdam, uh, in, in the Netherlands, in the Northern Netherlands, and in the Southern, and in the southern Netherlands. And this, this Hugh Broughton is like a, a it pops up, it's a pop-up pop -up printing house more or less. Different from that tradition, but Manasseh ben Israel, in a way, 1627, the Sedot Filot, for those of you who read Hebrew, the Book of Prayers, it's such a small booklet. I mean, one of the big, diff big problems that we have, of course, in our digital world, as wonderful as all the digital presentations of books are, you don't never know how big it is. So the, one of the most important, as everything that, we're, that, that I will show you today is as big as this screen, or as big as this screen. But there is a very important, I always teach this to my students, you have to see the original because there's an enormous difference in experience between an elephant folio and a miniature. They will all look, they will all have the same size. He, this, is, this portrait is twice as big as this little booklet. And you will think that the portrait belongs to the booklet. So this is an aspect that we should not forget. I mean, the, it's a very small booklet. It's a, typically a booklet that you take with you that you put in your, into your, that you put in your pocket. And it's, it's clearly, it's a, a book of prayers according to the right of the, of the Sephardic Jews of that period. Um, and Manasseh ben Israel produced it with the help of a number of uh, people. And Isaac Abob Tafonseca, the rabbi that I mentioned, that went to Brazil rather than Manasseh himself, was his first corrector. And he has a, an, an introduction as the corrector in which he explains what he was doing. And he says, Manasseh Yosef ben Israel, seeing the Bomberg types being worn out, I mentioned the types of Bomberg before, uh, and since nothing can be imper imperfect for the holy work, arose from within the community and went out and came to the house of an artisan. And behold, he was standing there at his work, the tools of his trade in his hand, and he said to him, behold, I give you the money and the shape of the letters to make it as, so to make it this is good in the eyes of the honorable and respected Michael Yuda, first among the scribes. So what the Manasseh ben Israel wanted is that he went to a punch cutter, he went to a type designer, and the type designer was given the instruction to do something that would come instead of the Bomberg types, but the approval, the formal approval of what it should look like, had to be done by the scribe, by the sofer, by the person who wrote by hand who knew the tradition, and it had to accord to the tradition, had to be in accordance with the tradition of book production of the Sephardic community. I will go into more, the, more of that. So the norm, if you want to speak it like that, the, the quality was, was defined not according to the quality of the, the, the comparison with other printed works, but rather to the quality of the written tradition, of the written script, because the holiness of the Hebrew script, at the end of the day, the holiest of holiest in her Hebrew scripts is the script written by hand, by, a, by an accomplished scribe. And he made it, and he shaped them, and he made them perfect. But he was a non-Jew who was given that. So he had, was a non-Jew had to do the work, because the non-Jews knew how to do the work. But the approval had to come from the scribe. The scribe had to tell that these letters were perfect. Nicolas Briot, he was the one who was responsible for those, and this is his contract. The Manasseh's Hebrew type, which is very interesting, this is earlier Hebrew, there's not a lot of difference. 
the Amsterdam Hebrew type would become famous as the Otiot Amsterdam, as the letters, the Hebrew letters of Amsterdam. And thousands of books outside Amsterdam were printed with the letters of Amsterdam, which was considered a sign of quality. But they, they are just Sephardic letters. I mean, there was nothing special other than high quality, uh, than high quality, high technical quality about these Amsterdam letters. They were Sephardic letters, but it was clearly strongly connected to Amsterdam. And the Sephardic letter became, became very important. And while Amsterdam became, after Manasseh ben Israel, exploded to become the, the main center of production for Hebrew books and printed books in the 17th century, it was already the norm, and it even more so became the quality sign. This is what our Hebrew scripts had looked like. And Ashkenazic German printers used it without thinking. They used it because it was a better letter. I mean, it was a letter that we are used to read, and even in today's Israel, the, at the core of all the modern Hebrew typography, the large majority of modern Hebrew typography that we consider as the regular uh, typefaces, at the core is the Sephardic morphology. And we owe this to this ongoing tradition, Manasseh ben Israel in Amsterdam into our, into our days, and from Manasseh ben Israel through Leiden, Antwerp, Venice, back actually to the 15th century, where already this, this choice for the Hebrew script of the Sephardim, of the Sephardic Jews, of the, of the Spanish Portuguese Jews was chosen. Probably also because they were all over the place. It was the typeface that, meant that the printers believed already in Italy to be the most popular. And it was also very easy to read, relatively speaking. So this is a comparison. Um, this is a book that we have upstairs. This is a book that I showed you. This is the portrait that you showed to me. Uh, Sefer Elim, 1629. I shall always show this book because I like it. You have this book upstairs. You will see it tomorrow. It's, it's the first, this is the first portrait a scholar from, from Kandia, in, the, in Crete, he, he, is the, uh, he came to Amsterdam, he was an itinerant scholar, and he came to Amsterdam to have his book printed on this newly founded printing press of Amsterdam. 1627, Manasseh started, 1629, the press was so well known that a scholar from Crete would come to Amsterdam to have his book printed. This is the first portrait that we have uh, of a living author in a Hebrew book. So we have some... References to portraits, but this is the fourth portrait. And, and the copy here upstairs has the portrait. The copy in Edschim doesn't, the copy in the Rosenthaliana does, but Edschim has the portrait outside the copy. So it's, a, there is the, it's, but it's, so it's a very important book. Part of it is Kabbalistic, part of it is philosophical, part of it is mathematical, but it's, a, it's an unbelievable book to realize that the fourth or fifth book produced by a new printing press would have the complexity of typesetting that this book has with all the formulas, all the drawings, all the, engra all the, uh, the, the, the engraving, everything that goes with it, the complexity of this type of printing goes to show the level of, of expertise that Benazza had, the level of being an accomplished printer that he had, but also the clear context that he must have had to non-Jewish printers, non-Jewish paper makers, and we know non-Jewish type cutters. So it's a constant back and forth between traditions. This is his first Hebrew grammar, I already mentioned that. This is the copy from the Rosenthaliana, Safa Brura, so it's, not, it's, it's actually in Spanish, the other one by Isaac Abob, that was is in Hebrew. Um, Manasseh's Hebrew grammar, it's printer's mark, the itinerant printer's mark, I mean there's a lot written on the printer's mark, um, but the uh, and it's, it's clearly a non-Jewish symbol. I mean, this is, this is the, 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 the peregrinant pil pilgrim going to, going to Santiago de Compostela. He's inspired by that. But it, it, so he, he thinks of himself still as an itinerant guy, and his seal has the same emblem. It has the same printed mark. So the, uh, this is important. He was also a book dealer. He sold his books. He sold uh, Hebrew books. He sold Spanish books. And uh, it's a list of, his, uh, of the various books that you can order from him in 1648. So he was very active. He was supplier of Hebrew, book, of Hebrew books and, and non-Hebrew books for Queen Christina of Sweden. He moved to the Frankfurt Buchmesse. I mean, he was really very active in the book trade.
but I constantly speak with you about this idea of we are from Spain. We are a people that have a strong connection to Spain. And Spain has its own book tradition. Spain has its own very important, the Jews of Spain have a very important, we, we basically have five or six centers of Hebrew book production, manuscript production, of course, before the invention of printing uh, in the Jewish world. The Orient, with a separate section in the Yemen. Italy, which is a very old Jewish, European Jewish community, um, where, as of the 11th century, we see the production of a lot of Hebrew books. The first Hebrew books written by hand that we have are all from the Orient. The earliest date that we find in the Hebrew book at all is 903, in a small fragment of the book of Nehemiah. Um, and after that, we have 905, 916, and these are all Bibles. These are all Hebrew Bibles, annotated Hebrew Bibles with the full critical appar apparatus that, that comes with the Hebrew Bible. And this was really the time in which the, uh, the oral tradition of transmitting the Hebrew Bible sort of, sort of uh, came to a close and, and, and was turned into a written uh, tradition of the Hebrew Bible, of the text of the Hebrew Bible, through these old Bibles, all Oriental. Italy, as of the 12th century, we see Spain, the, the Iberian Peninsula, until that very moment of the expulsion. So the, we have a few manuscripts, there is in the Berginsky collection in Zurich, which you mentioned, is a manuscript that was a Hebrew Bible. It was copied in the city of Ocaña in Spain in 1491. And the second volume, this copy has a, it has a colophon, and the second volume mentions it was finished in the city of Evora in Portugal in 1594. Two years, it says explicitly, two years after the expulsion from Castilia. Mm. So the, uh, we have actually Hebrew manuscripts that were Taken, this is a Hebrew Bible that was written, started in Spain, Jews were expelled, the book was finished in Portugal. But, and, then it has, and then it stops. Books disappear. You mentioned the Hilo Codex, this, this, this uh, crime story that I wrote. It's about the search for a Hebrew Bible, of which the last trace is at the beginning of the 16th century, uh, in, probably in Tunisia, taken from Spain by the refugees from Spain, to Tunisia and disappeared. And the rest of that book is my fantasy about what happened to the book. Um, they did beautiful books in, uh, in, 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 in Spain. I mean, there was an enormous, and then we have here, here this, this is for me the most important thing here is the script. This is a very elongated Hebrew type. Long, it's monumental. It's a so-called Haggadah. The Haggadah is the story of the, of the Exodus from Egypt, the biblical story of the Exodus from Egypt. It's the Hebrew word for account, for story, Haggadah, and it's the text that's being read at the first night of the first two nights of the festival of Passover, and it celebrates the liberation of the Jewish people from Egypt. And it's the most popular Hebrew book that was ever produced. You use it every year. It's illustrated, it's, it's, it's decorated or illustrated. We have hundreds of illustrated Haggadot of the medieval period, and we have almost 6,000 printed editions of the Haggadah uh, up until today. And every year, 10 or 15 or 20 new Haggadot will be published worldwide. And they will be modernized, they will have modern interpretations. But the start of this tradition was really in the late 13th century in Spain, and in southern Germany, which is the next center. Farad, and the other center is in Europe, is Ashkenaz. Ashkenaz is the Hebrew word for Germany, or for the Germanic lands, and Ashkenaz in the Middle Ages is largely northern France and southern Germany, but then in the course of the 15th century, it moves eastward. So those are the important centers, and we have a Byzantine center, I forgot about that. So we have Orient, Italy, Spain, uh, Ashkenaz and the Byzantine area, the, the Ottoman Empire, so to speak, where, where you have different editions of Hebrew writing. For, for me, the script is important here. This is very monumental, it's very elongated. 
And this is a more typical manuscript, Morin de Mochim, a Leiden manuscript, a manuscript kept in Leiden University. This, this is square script, Hebrew script that literally, which we call square script, that literally is the monumental kind of script that you would use for a Bible or a prayer book. And this is a so-called semi-cursive script, not a cursive hand, but a semi-cursive hand, which is the regular book hand of the Middle Ages. So that is the kind of, so it, it, it's all, at the end of the day, it's all about the number of times that you have to lift your pen when you write. If you want to write a book, you want to have a certain flow in your writing, you can write the cursive with like, like you would write the letter. The semi-curve is more, more monumental. It's easier to read. You get used to this script relatively easily. Clearly influenced by the Arabic script. It has, a, it has an oriental tone to it, an oriental feel to it. Um, but this is actually, and this of course again is the square script, which is easier to read. So you, basically you have all the regional vi variants, Oriental, Yemenite, Byzantine, Sephardic, Ashkenazic, Italian. You have either square script, which is very monumental, or semi-cursive, which is easier to write, or cursive, which you would use for, a, a, to, to, for, your, for your shopping list or for a letter that you would write to someone. We actually have a lot of shopping lists. Um, and this is a script that the Jews, this is the script that the Jews of Amsterdam, the, uh, well, I'm there, that's good. This is the script that the Jews of Amsterdam uh, knew or were felt connected with because it's the script that was used in Spain, on the Iberian Peninsula, in Sfarad, back in the days in which they were still there. And they felt a strong connection with this script. This is that same script. I mean, it gives you a sense. And what you usually see here is what I said before. Because here you can also see an indication of the number of strokes that are necessary to write such a letter. It's a very peculiar script. You will, uh, there will not be a lot of calligraphers today who will easily reproduce it. It's, it's beautiful. It's very curly. It's clearly influenced by the, by the Arabic, but it's highly typical, and you would only find it here in, let's say, this, the last decades before the expulsion from Spain. In this manuscript of Moreno Ochim that I showed to you before, this manuscript of an important text by the most important medieval Jewish scholar of Spain, of the Spanish world, Moses Maimonides. Moses Maimonides was born in 1138, died in 1204. Maimonides wrote this philosophical treatise in which he, in which he called the guide of the perplexed. And the perplexed are a definition of the people who are trying to define the priority of reason over uh, revelation. Is reason more important, humor reason more important, or is at the end of the day, biblical revelation more important. And the perplexed were the ones who didn't know. He, for him, revelation is the most important. The, 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 the holy revelation is the most, the, the, the divine revelation is the most important. But there were a lot of opponents. He wrote this in Arabic, it was translated into Hebrew. He wrote it in Judeo-Arabic with Hebrew script. It was translated into Hebrew in southern France by his most important translators. And this is, and through these translations, a lot of ideas of Arabic scholars, which Maimonides worked with, of Muslim scholars, thinkers on the revelation, uh, reason, entered the non-Jewish world because many non-Jewish scholars were capable of reading the Hebrew, whereas they were not capable of reading the Arabic. So he was also without, uh, un one, unwillingly, but one, it was not his goal. His goal was to, to discuss with his fellow Jews and perhaps with some Muslim colleagues what he wanted to tell. But he also helped, it also helped the insights of the Arabic world, of the Muslim world, as it was being absorbed by the Jewish world to move into the, uh, into the, in the, into the Christian world and into the minds of Christian thinkers and Christian philosophers. But here for, so here for me the script is important. This is this kind of script. And if you look at the script here, this is one of the very first written uh, pieces that we have. It's in the Israel Museum now. 
was not always, I say smilingly, this is in Israel, museum in Israel. It's a ketubah, a so-called marriage contract, uh, which is read at the marriage ceremony uh, in every, on every Jewish wedding. It's a contract which basically stipulates the rights of the woman. And the, it, it has a definition of the dowry, it has the date, it has signatures of the witnesses, and sometimes it has additional conditions that define the marriage, the marital stage. And it started in Italy, but it was copied in Amsterdam. Very soon, um, these so-called kutubot, these so-called marriage contracts, were decorated. Why? Because they were also considered a gift to the bride. And the bride would, would, would be handed over a beautiful marriage contract, not only as a legal contract of her legal rights, but also as a beautiful bridal gift. But a second ground, a second background, especially in Italy, was that this is a text that's being read aloud during the uh, wedding ceremony in the synagogue. So it was read aloud, and the congregation could see how much you spent. They could see it was also a sign of wealth, a sign of showing off. And this is no fantasy, because in the city of Ancona in Italy, in 1768 and 18 some 18 something, the rabbis defined a maximum sum of money that you were allowed to spend on your kutubah. <coughs> so, this is a, mm, this is no fantasy. The script that he uses is the square script that I showed to you. Very, very similar to the printed script and very, very similar to the script of the 15th century. Uh, but written by Abraham Cohen de Rira, a very important Spanish scholar, Kabbalistic knowledge. You can see the calligraphers at work here, and they combine the scripts. It's, it's, oh, the script is there, the handwriting is there. So why do I call it a book culture? I'm not talking about printed books only. There was a coexistence of handwritten production of books and of printed production of books. And there was a coexistence of Hebrew, Spanish, Latin, Portuguese, Dutch, all at the same time. And it's all part of the same book culture, catered for by the same people. The same financiers, the same people who provided the funds, the same artisans who were involved. We have handwritten Megillot, handwritten Esther scrolls, by the same people who did engraved Esther scrolls. So the, the, there's a constant back and forth. So there is a one book culture. There's not just a book thing. But, and this is one very important guy, Matatya de Um This is a little scroll in the Rosentaliana. It's this big, little scroll, and, and, and very small, in which, which is called the show of hands. It has 10 of such, 10 such panels, and he showed all the different scripts that he could write by hand. And he would show to his clients, this is what I can write. And is now kept in the Rosenthaliana. We know a lot about him. He, was, he died in shipwreck. And there's a manuscript in, in Eschayim Library that defines it. It was copied in 1690 uh, in the city of Amsterdam. But here's something very strange going on. Here we have this script that you've seen before, this very uh, curly script of the, of the 15th century that I mentioned before. Here we have the Hebrew script. And here you have all the Hebrew letters just upside down. So you have the Hebrew letter. This is an aleph, this is a bait, but there's another bait on top of it. There's another gimel on top of it. There's a, so he, he, it's a very interesting experiment. That he, he was a funny calligrapher. That he was interested in calligraphy, not necessarily only in text. For him, it's the craft of calligraphy, as you can see here as well. He could write Latin, they could write Arabic, they could write Syriac, they could write anything. Um, the one before, Judah Maccabeo, is mentioned in archives in Spain, at the, end of the 60s, at, the, at the end of the 40s of the 17th century, as a Jew from La Rochelle, where, where he was then living, same La Rochelle that I mentioned before, with whom you could order, uh, with whom you could solicit uh, forged trade documents in Spanish. So, I mean, they, make, they made a living. They made a living out of their calligraphy. This is that same Atatya di Shakaboab. You can see the same script here that I showed to you before. This is another, and it continued into the 18th century. So what, I, what I'm arguing, 
And this is another printed book. This is all, I'm just giving you a few examples now. This is all the same kind of, it's all the same world. It's part of the same world. Handwritten printing, handwriting printing, choices of letters. This is, this is something I will skip. And this is that same Yuda Maccabeu from La Rochelle in 1655, where he was before he went back to Amsterdam. He was apparently in Brazil. Another show of hands. All kinds of script in Hebrew, in, in Arabic, all the kinds of script that you could simply get from him. It's kept in Etzchayim. Let's go back to this medieval Sephardi script. This is the script that I showed to you before. And this is the script in 1690, in the manuscript by that same scribe, kept in the Royal Library. It's exactly the same letter. So this is the letter of 1480, and this is the letter of 1690. And here you have them together. So, what is going on here? What is going on here is a conscious, conscious decision to reconnect with pre-expulsion Spanish German, the jury. The Jews of Amsterdam used the script, they also used the literature, they studied Spanish literature, they continued, they, 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 they idealized pre-expulsion, pre-1492, uh, 1495, 96, so the I idealized pre-1492, pre-1495, 96, um, Spanish Judaism, and they re-identified with that lost identity, bringing it back to the topics of refugees, they re-identified with the lost identity by, rather than writing the script that the co-religionists of Sephardic origin in Constantinople would be writing, which is a continuation of the 15th century, they stepped more than a century back, and what, almost two centuries back in 1690, and re-identified with the script that brought them into connection with their Spanish homeland, with their Iberian homeland. And this defines this Hebrew, uh, this Hebrew tradition, this Jewish tradition of the book always being about the ideas, always being about the intellectual world, always having some sort of connection with the religious background of the particular person, but in its shape, in its form, always also identified by a self-definition of identity. And the self-definition of identity is crucial to our understanding of Hebrew, of the history of the Jewish book in general. Well, the last thing that I want to bring in is this thing that is, this is hackneyed among uh, book scholars. It's, it's a, a publication of the 1980s in which Robert Danton developed what is called the communication circuit. There's a lot of criticism on the, on the diagram, I'm totally aware of it. But what it shows is what the point that I actually made before, which is that you have an author, the author is in touch with the publisher, the publisher goes to the printers, compositors, pressmen, warehousemen, who is in touch with the suppliers of paper, ink, type, and labor. They go to the shippers, the agents, the smugglers, of course. There's also a lot of smuggling of books going on, the entrepot keepers, the wagoner, everything, and everyone involved. You go to the booksellers, the wholesaler, the retailer, the peddler, the binder, all the people involved in selling books, because books were often sold unbound. Then you go to the readers, who are purchasers, who are borrowers, who are part of reading clubs, who are libraries, and they have their own binders. And then it goes back to the author. And in the meantime, there are intellectual influences, publicity, economic, social conjuncture, political and legal sanctions. This is, this is one way of representing the process of, of the transmission of knowledge in the printed book. As I said, there is a lot of, and, and also Darnton himself is no longer a fan of this, but it's very helpful to understand the unique position of a figure like Manasseh ben Israel, with whom I started, this Manasseh ben Israel here in his Hebrew grammar and in his book list, and in, his, in the letter that he wrote to Isaac Fossius, to understand he basically played all these roles. He was an author, he was a publisher, he was a printer, he was involved in the composing, he was, uh, he was also a corrector, by the way. He was involved as an agent. He was a book dealer. He sold, he produced to the shippers, but he also sold books of others, and he sold his own books. He was a reader because he was also a scholar. 
and the scholar is a reader. And then he goes back to the author, his, himself being the author and others being the author. So the, what, I, what, what is important for me to keep in mind as a, as a finish of this, of this uh, keynote is the fact that you cannot separate the production of Hebrew printed books and the production of Hebrew manuscripts. And this is a plea that I make more often, which goes very much for all the material that is being, the esoteric material, the, 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 uh, all the material that is being collected here. It's exactly the same thing. There will always be printed transmission, there will always be oral transmission, and there will always be handwritten transmission. And we have to see this as one culture. This one culture which is always also defined by the identity of the people for whom it was made and by whom it was made. And if that is the takeaway, I thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks for that fascinating talk, really eye-opening. Sorry that was a bit longer, but it <laughs> <laughs> happens. Yeah. Well, um, I invite you to take a seat, and I'm sure that um, our audience has a few questions. Also, our audience at home, if I can manage to control my computer. <laughs> So, do we have any, any questions for Emil? Uh, thank you, first of all, uh, for this fantastic lecture. It, it was a fascinating uh, look at, at all of this and all these interconnections. I was wondering, because you, you put great emphasis on the desire to remain connected to this heritage from the Iberian Peninsula, was wondering, um, because Benjamin Israel has made a lot of the, the shock that um, Portuguese independence from the Iberian Union and, and the loss of, um, of Dutch Brazil back to, to Portugal uh, formed for the, um, for the Portuguese Jewish community in Amsterdam and how um, this, this failure of the Portuguese crown to roll back the Inquisition and other uh, institutions, uh, anti-Semitic institutions imposed by Spain, uh, this failure uh, led to uh, the Portuguese Jewish community to a degree um, denying their Portuguese heritage or cutting it off to a degree, calling themselves no longer the Portuguese nation in Amsterdam, but the Jewish nation in Amsterdam. I was wondering if this, um, this big cut, as, as Israel uh, depicts it, if that is reflected in the book culture and in the printing and writing culture as well. Thank you. I think it's an interesting question. My, my first guess would be not, not entirely. The, the, a, a lot of it involves not so much, I, I think that there were, yes, you're right. I mean, the, if, if only through the context with the family members who were still on the Iberian Peninsula, where they're very much, the, only on account of that they were very much aware of what's going on there. And if I were to use a word that probably defines the way that I see it, it's probably more nostalgia. So there is a not nostalgic uh, longing for a lost homeland, but that lost homeland is still being occupied. There's still people who live there are still members of the family. And, and they do read and appreciate the literature, for example. So there was a, a clear, at least among intellectuals, a clear literary appreciation also of what was going on in Spain and Portugal, especially in Spain, in the 17th century. So Spanish poetry, Spanish stage plays. Um, the, 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 there's a, there's a, a, an instance uh, of a uh, stage play that was performed in one of the synagogues in 1624, the Alago dos Montes, a stage play in which the uh, mountains of the land of Israel discuss which, which of the mountains qualifies as the mountain for Moses to receive the, to the tablets of the law. <laughs> and it was performed in synagogue and once. And then they thought, oh, this is a little, perhaps a little bit too far, but it, it, is, the, uh, it, is, a com it, it is a copy of the so-called auto in, in Spain and one actor in which things like this were being, the, one act play in which things like this would, would be discussed. So they were, and they had a nostalgic connection to the pre-expulsion, but they were clearly intellectual, literary, 
um, scholarly uh, connections with, uh, with contemporary Spain and Portugal as well. And I'm not convinced that this cut on that level is all that clear. So the, I think that the, because the, for example, the, the, the first, we have a manuscript in Etzchayim of this play, Dialogo des Monsters, which, which is 1640s, I think. It's a little bit later than when it was performed, but it's 1640. But the first printed edition is 1756. And it was a, a, a text that was still considered to be, uh, to be of interest to the community, to be printed within the community, and, and to be published in Spanish uh, in the community as late as the second half of the 18th century. So, the, so I hope that answers your question. I think the, I think, I think the, the we have to define, define, make a division between the intellectual and the political slash economical. Can you tell us something about the tradition of the Sefer Yetzirah? Not too much from the top of my head, I'm, uh, I'm afraid. The, what is interesting in Amsterdam is the way in which the, this is a more generic answer to, what you, to, to your question. Um, the, what we see in Amsterdam is a, in, in terms of printing, which texts are being printed, is a double approach. The, there is a, many of the printers, especially the, the, the bigger printers of the, uh, in Raziel is, the Yetzirah is, is is important, Raziel is also important, we have Raziel upstairs, a couple of the, of the important Kabbalistic works, they are part of this uh, quest for the Jewish essence. That is the, that is the Kabbalistic, that is Kabbalistic study, and that was very important for the intellectual, the, Kabbali, the, the, the Sephardic intellectual elite. So much more so than the Ashkenazic uh, intellectual elite in those days, I mean, it became global, or it became a European thing, a more, more, more generic thing and then later on. Um, the Many printers would simply print the books that people ask for, while at the same, and, and people, that is literally, you bring a bag of money, you bring two or three letters from a rabbi that the book can be trusted and it was printed, and they would often bring it back to the country where they came from after they would come to Amsterdam. Some of the printers, some of the, especially the bigger printer ha printing houses, also had a program of books that they considered of importance. And the truth is, in terms of Yitzira and also Raziel and a couple of the, of the I, I don't really have an answer because I never asked myself the question yeah. uh, to, to, of which these are part. Of which these are part. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I think that on a, if you if you look at it from that perspective, the the interesting thing, of course, in in and and print both print, but again, it's about printing and manuscript editions. The uh, introduction through, let's say, Christian scholars inspired by humanism. They're not necessarily traditional humanists, but Christian scholars inspired by humanism. The adoption and the introduction of Jewish religious thinking, and especially the fringes of Jewish religious thinking into the thinking of, let's say, uh, Europe, their particular European peers, that is a very interesting phenomenon. The, it, because there, 
it, it, it is at the core of the development of what we today call Christian Kabbalah. I mean, the, the, and, the, and, the, and, and the, the introduction, but I, I was trying, my first answer was more geared toward Amsterdam, but, the, but the, if, if you look at it on the that, on that general intellectual level, the, the, it, it is a very interesting phenomenon that, that the, and, and of course, one of the questions that always fascinates me is how the knowledge of this Jewish tradition was acquired by these Christian scholars. Mm -hmm. Who were there, who were informing them? Mm -hmm. Was this a matter of cooperation? Was this a matter of self-study? Was it a com combination? We know from the printing history that, that I've mentioned all the Talmud editions and everything you have from Venice, they are a very strong cooperation between Jews and Jews. And non -Jews. Mm -hmm. uh, we know certain rabbis who, who made a living off of uh, being involved in printing Hebrew for humanist scholars, for example, and for the, for the, for the world of humanists. But the, uh, the, the, the more esoteric and the, 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 uh, the, the, the reception of Kabbalistic knowledge in the Christian world, I think there's still work to be done about the interaction between the Jewish scholars and the level of interaction between Jewish scholars and non-Jewish scholars. This is what I could say on a more generic level. Sefer Yitzhira as such, we showed in this exhibit that I mentioned, we showed this very, very early, the earliest example that we have of Sefer Yitzhira from Italy. Uh, a very, very, I think it's 11th century manuscript. It's the first manuscript that we have of Sefer Yitzhira. And, and it's, it's, it's at the core of, of, of Jewish identity also. It's at the core of Jewish religion. But Judaism has, for example, also a warning that knowledge on this, knowledge on the Maaseh Bereshit, knowledge on the work of creation, also knowledge on the Maaseh Merkawam, knowledge on the work on the Holy Chariot, the first chapter of Ezekiel, mm -hmm. uh, is, should be restricted to scholars over 40. <laughs> because it's too, uh, it's in the Talmud, it's in the Mishnah and it's in the Talmud. Mm -hmm. Because it's too confusing and too dangerous to study otherwise. So that puts an interesting perspective on this interaction. If, if it's too dangerous for Jews uh, under 40, what about the context with scholars outside your own, uh, outside your own group? So I don't really have an answer to that. You need a bigger specialist than I am to, to answer that question. But we have to th think about it in this vein. But also, I said you mentioned between Menashe ben Israel and Rembrandt. Yeah, was, well, Rembrandt and Menashe is, in, is interesting. I mean, we don't know for a fact how well they've known each other. We do know that the likelihood that they would have bumped into each other yeah. on Floyberg is, is, is 100%. So, uh, but the, the actual factual proof is, is not existent. So the, so the uh, and this is of course, it's, uh, um, it, it's you, can, you cannot imagine that they would have not, not have known each other, but we don't have written proof of that. So the, uh, I think well, there was a question also in back of you. Do you, do you? Sorry, sorry. This is a, this is a very simple, mundane question. When we talk about the Jewish book uh, culture in Amsterdam, on which streets and which neighborhoods were most of these studios, bookshops, and things located? On the on Floyenburg, the which is where the uh, where the the uh, Stopa now is, the town hall and the opera house. Um, the old Jewish neighborhood around that, and on some of the canals, on the inner circle of the canals. That is mm -hmm. basically where mm -hmm. we would. Floyberg is actually known to be, to have, to have held a couple of. Uh, yes, this gentleman. So the, in the core of the Jewish quarter. Thank you so much for your lecture. I was very interested by the fact how you sketched the networks uh, with people who were refugees from Spain and came to the Netherlands or Holland. But I was thinking and wondering if you go back to the political bigger picture, uh, Holland was at war for 80 years with Spain. And when you lived in, uh, after the fall of Antwerp in 1585, you stayed in the southern Netherlands, you were part of Spain. 
does this political uh, constellation influence, in a way, the politics of print? Well, it's one of the reasons why Christopher Plantin moved part of his printing activity to Leiden. Um, so that there's a, there's a very clear connection between the political events of those days. I think we're talking 1578 or something. Um, the, it also, the identification of the Portuguese Jews as Portuguese in a, situ in a time of war with the Spanish, many of them were Spanish. I mean, the, so the, the, the traditional explanation is also that they used, not entirely true, I think, you, you can maybe add to that, but the, the, the fact that they define themselves as Portuguese Jews, whereas many of them would also have come from Spain, is also to be seen in the context of, of, the, of the foreign oppressor of the period, which happened to be Spain. Um, so the, the uh, but that, 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 that's more complex than that. And uh, there are other, other scholars who, yes, there is a connection, but it's not the only explanation. But, but so, so yes, the political situation is always there. Um, but the Jews were in a particularly interesting position because of these family networks. They had their cousin uh, living in Spain and they were living under a Dutch alias uh, in the Netherlands, so they could trade. They could trade. So there was, it wasn't. It's it's the quality of the, of that network and the and the and the special nature of that network that that helped define the the special position that Jews had there, and which also made them interesting for the local authorities in a city like Amsterdam to allow them in, although there were quite a few religious concerns. So the uh, this was going on there. If that answers your question, yeah. I wanted to follow up on the, the discussion about the contact between learned Jews and Christians. Because many of us at the conference um, study, um, you know, radical Christians, people who thought that the apocalypse was coming, many who wanted either to convert Jews or um, to, to gain access to Jewish knowledge or even to try to build up something new with Jews so that Jews and these these reformed Christians together would somehow be the chosen people. So there are all these interests. Um, and of course, when you talked about Manasseh going to England, um, Jews being allowed back into England could be seen very much as part of this apocalyptic Christian uh, well, worldview. So yeah, is there something there? Yeah. Uh, there is a lot there. And, 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 and uh, Josef Kaplan has written a lot about this and about the, the uh, in this this intellectual stance in the in the in the readmission. So the there are a number of articles in Studio Rosentaliana by Josef Kaplan who wrote about this. Uh, it also this this very point also is an aspect of uh, Manasseh ben Israel's disputed position within the community. Mm -hmm. He was in strong contact with the millenarians, mm -hmm. um, and the and there were the, there was there was so much interaction between Manasseh and the millenarians that he got into trouble. So, so that there, there is a, so, so he was, he was an interesting figure. The, the fact that within that very same community, Spinoza would arrive, um, is also a token of the fact that people were in search of, of these fringes, of these borders, of, 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 you know, it's called religious extremism in a way. I mean, extremism in, to the sense that the, the people were trying to stretch a definition uh, of, of their identity. So, I, I concentrate on identity, also concentrate on the book culture, but the. But this is a very important aspect, the, which is another reason why I think that these theological treatises that I showed to you, mm -hmm. they serve this intellectual purpose. They serve the purpose of, of religious, uh, not so much as purpose of bringing in an individual Jew who thinks that he should be, who is considering to return to Judaism, but rather uh, this, this ongoing discussion with the outside world which, which many of these people were in constant contact. And Manasseh was the most extreme in that respect, but there were others as well. Mm -hmm. Other questions? Well, if there are no other questions, I think I would like to invite everyone to have a beverage, and we have some kosher snacks from Israel <laughs> that good. have been prepared. So um, please join us, and join me in thanking Emil Steiger. <laughs>